So, right. I can so shop this. Recording now. And playing on three. One, two, and three. I wasn't going to do this one. But okay. I decided I, I, I need to. New music. These are the confessions of a band geek. Time to get personal. If I could, I'd probably do things differently. Uh, these are the confessions of a band geek. Reminiscing, thinking how I got to where I'm at. Throat back before I even learned how to rap. Tell my story kind of sort of like my diary. These are the confessions of a band geek. Music molded me and made me, me. If I could, I'd probably do things differently. I used to only take my horn home once a week. These are the confessions of a band geek. Fifth grade, I remember it like yesterday. I saw the band and decided I wanted to play. I tried the trombone and the sax, but that wasn't fun. I always had rhythm, so I wanted to play the drums. But ain't nothing happening, I guess it was too late. I decided I ain't want to play them anyway. Then the director told <laughs> you can lie. Then the director told me give the coronet a try. Handed it to me and told me to try to make a sound. Watching the hands to make sure I had the form down. Couple people staring, so I'm not trying to look stupid now. Played it so loud, I had everyone looking around. From that moment, I decided it was all. Fifth and sixth grade passed, I was still going strong. Seventh grade, my folks were glad I was serious about something. Moms took me up to Sadler's and bought me my own trumpet. <laughs> For real. Before I even learned how to rap Tell my story kind of sort of like my diary These are the confessions of a band geek Music molded me and made me, me If I could I'd probably do things differently I used to only take my horn home once a week Um, uh, 8th grade at Waldo, everything switched That's when I met Mr. Conrad and Mr. Tripp New beginnings, never seen nothing like this Private school to public school, I had to get a grip. Met a gang of homies that I loved like my brothers. Straight clowning up in class, couldn't tell us nothing. Walked to school every day with Louis Sotero. Was taken way too soon, we'll see you again though. Freshman year at East High, man it flew by. Still all up in my shell, I was super shy. Was cool with all the jocks cause my brother Hoop, my cousins Trees and Ann had me plugged with all the ladies too. Sophomore year, it felt like heavy pep band Playing in the stands, drunk off 211 At the games, me and Vernon used to wild out And all my fellow band geeks know what I'm talking about Straight up <laughs> Before I even learned how to rap These are the confessions of a band geek Music molded me and made me, me If I could, I'd probably do things differently I used to only take my horn home once a week. The year was when I started skipping class. My mom had found out I guarantee she kicked me. Did football one year and also did track. I threw the shot put in the disc, but really I was whack. Playing the trumpet was the only thing I stuck with. And that was only because my moms wouldn't let me quit. Hardly took my horn home being lazy. I was good and that's what drove Mr. Kaiser shot crazy. Can't forget the day he told me he was disappointed. Said I could have done something with the music if I wanted. The Walt Disney Parade marching. That's when my vision of being an artist really got started. But everything I know now, I wish I knew it then. I would have realized this music is my calling. So all the shorties coming up, remember no matter what. Time is precious. Don't waste it. No stalling. Go all in. Throat back before I even learned how to rap. Tell my story kind of sort of like my diary. These are the confessions of a band geek. Music molded me and made me, me. And if I could, I'd probably do things differently. I used to only take my horn home once a week. These are the confessions of a band geek. Rise and shine. Pour yourself a cup of coffee and tune in to Good Morning Aurora. News, weather, and really cool interviews. Monday through Friday from 8 to 9 a.m.
morning, Aurora. Good morning, Aurora. Good morning, Aurora. The time is 8 o'clock a.m. You're listening to and watching Good Morning, Aurora, the second largest city's first daily news podcast. It's Monday, the 6th of June. And as we were here with our guests talking about history, it's a very important and historical day. Today is the day that Allied forces landed in Normandy, France. Uh, there were five beaches. Can anyone name those five beaches? Oh boy! Can you uh, name those five beaches, my brother? I don't know. One of them was can. Omaha. Omaha, uh, Utah. Um, let's see. There was Sword. Was Sword. that one of them? Mm -hmm. um, there was. Well, the whole thing was called Operation Overlord. I remember that. That's right. And then, God, what were the other two? Um, oh, Juno. Juno. Yes, that and was the gold. Gold. Yes, yes. I always forget about gold. <laughs> Juno, yes, you had three. I feel, I feel pretty good about that. You know, yeah, you, you, know you, have the, you have the one that we always think. Yeah. Right, that was yeah. true. Yeah. Um, so yes, that is true. That is uh, that's some history, but we've got more history to talk about today. Today our guests are uh, Dan Jeremy Brooks and Helen Ratslow, representing the Aurora Film Society. How are you guys doing? Good. Okay. Very good. All right. Good to see you, Dan. It's your first time. Helen, it's your second. Yeah. You're back. <laughs> Just like that. I told you I had so many irons in the fire yes, that it yeah, verged yeah. on crazy. Good. <laughs> um, so we hope that everybody out there is doing good today. Johnny Felix, Talento Creations, good morning. Josie Mendoza Geller, good morning to you as well. And Dora Sanchez Soto, good morning to you. Maria, how are you feeling? Feeling great today. Happy Monday, everyone. That is right. That is right. It is Monday. Okay. Um, so we're going to talk about films. We're going to talk about movies and great productions and everything, but uh, I introduced yourselves briefly. Uh, Dan, let's start a little bit with you. Sure. Tell us who you are, where you're from, and, and uh, what's up with Monday. Uh, well, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm board member of the Roar Film Society, uh, which has been around since 2018. Um, I'm originally from uh, Boulder Hill, which is uh, sort of in Montgomery, sort of Oswego. We're sort of... Down the road. Yeah, mm -hmm. down the road. We're kind of unincorporated. I, I like to joke that it's sort of the Wild West, because we get like our water from Montgomery and our power, I don't know, whatever. Anyway, it's very confusing. <laughs> so they're unincorporated, so yeah. But um, so I've lived here my whole life. And uh, anyway, I've been involved with the Aurora Film Society since 2019. And I've been a board member since the end of 2019. So. All right. Yeah. Glad to have you, brother. Thanks. Nice shirt, by the way. I'm oh. digging that, man. Not Thank you. Not Tommy Plass. Uh... <laughs> yes, definitely a film theme here. Yes. You know? Yeah, yeah it's a little diehard for you. I've got several Die Hard shirts, actually. Uh, it's the weirdest thing. I, I keep accruing these things. And Is Die Hard a Christmas movie or just an action flick? It is. It is a Christmas film. It is an action film, too. But the Christmas element is so integral to it. It's, it's not just sort of sprinkled along like ornamentation. It's so essential. I mean, even the score has elements of you know, Handel's Messiah and... Um, some other Christmas stuff I'm not thinking of right now. It's it's mm -hmm. it's so essential to it that you you couldn't do it in July. You right. know, I don't think. Uh, Absolutely. So, yeah. Helen. Okay, so Helen Ratzlow. I I've lived in Aurora since uh, 2011. Okay. Before that, I grew up in Beloit, Wisconsin. I lived in Chicago. I lived in New York City. I lived in uh, Chicago again. I lived in uh, Batavia. And uh, I always call uh, Aurora's my Goldilocks town. It's the one that's just right for me. Um, I like that. Yeah, yeah I, I like that. I, you know, I've lived in big cities, little cities, and this one is just hits the right the right tone for me. Plus, um, First Fridays is like a part of my life because I know that I'm going to see uh, almost everybody I know at least mm -hmm. once a month. Yeah. So community here is really awesome. Good. I've been in the film society since the beginning because Jeannie Norris made me. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> she didn't about make right. me. She didn't make me, but she positive pressure, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. You were voluntold. And, it, and it's <laughs> voluntold. <laughs> And it's a, it's a it's a great adventure, when we, especially when we sit down around the table and brainstorm. Okay, what films are we going to do for the next season? Yes, yes. And um, yeah, we're going to do that pretty soon. Here. Pretty yeah. soon, we yeah. got to figure out twenty twenty three. Okay. And now, um, well, we can talk about it later, I guess. But because of COVID, we stopped our live 
get-togethers and started a virtual season. Right. And now we're going to continue with two parallel seasons. Yeah. A virtual and a live season. So. Okay. So the virtual is going to stay a part of it. Right. And so we'll for the next season we'll be figuring we'll be brainstorming twenty four films instead of twelve. Okay, so um, so is that the activities? It's brainstorming and discussing and pulling apart the films that are out there. Um, is, is that I'm sure it's more than just that, but is that the activity? We well, as the board, yeah. Okay, the board. We get together and around somebody's table and just we take turns pitching films that we like, and then we you know, discuss it and winnow it down, 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 down. Because so, my current list... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is a running joke for Helen My News. current list yeah. is about 40 films long. Oh, yeah, yeah. I've oh, got... Wow. Yeah, I've... I've Probably it's going to get to about 40 for me when I'm before I'm done. So Yeah, yeah. so because mm -hmm. this morning I just thought of it. Oh, I said, oh, Putney Swope, write it down. Oh, hey, nice saying? choice. I know. That would be so, a um, show, actually. Yeah. yeah. What was the most recent film you guys uh, deconstructed? Ooh, oh, what, the see. one that we talked about? The, the the last one that we did on our virtual. Oh yeah, yeah. Was THX one one three eight? Yes, yes. Or 1138, which is um, um, what Lucas? Mm -hmm. Lucas? Yeah, George Lucas's debut. First film. It was a remake of his college thesis film. Okay. And it's um, it's a sci-fi. It's great. Oh, it is. It's got um Robert Duvall as the main character, okay. and it's a future dystopian society where everyone is controlled through through um drug injections and drug you know their their emotions and their sexuality and everything is suppressed mm -hmm. so that they're just like worker bees okay and but a few people break out it's a, it's a very good film it right. is a very good film it There's is always a few people who don't get captured and all that like terminator right. 2 right yes but, you know, the whole world's gone, but there's the resistance. There's always that resistance. <laughs> yes, yes. And yes. sci-fi is, <laughs> and sci-fi is never about the 25th century. Sci-fi right. is always about right now. Mm -hmm. It's always about what we're dealing with now, and it's True. dealing. I think it's a lot of times the theme is what does it mean to be a human being? Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, like uh, Orwell's 1984. I mean, you know, he, called, he he was set in 1984, but it was written in 1948. So you just reversed the eight and the four. Right. So I mean, it was very much about uh, the totalitarian um, uh, lean uh, at the time. Right. And it's funny because THX 1138 reminds me quite a bit of 1984 and Brave New Worlds in that it takes sort of the totalitarian uh, constant watching and surveillance element. Uh, from 1984, but then it has the 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 medic over medication, the almost government subsidized or government enforced medication that you see in Brave New World. So it's an intriguing mix of the two. And you also see like seeds of um, of future Lucas films because yes. there's a one point where they're constructing their robot and it looks mm. like C3PO. <laughs> C3PO, you know? yeah, yeah, that's right. Yes, that's right. That it, that was really striking. Um, oh, and then there's the baton that the that the policemen, the police robots have, and it makes this whoop, whoop, whoop <laughs> sound, you know, like the laser, yeah. like the, uh, light uh, lightsaber, yeah, lightsabers, yep. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Aisha Saxon, good morning, Sandra. Good morning to you, dear friend. Good to see you. Um, everybody's in here. And Dora, hello to you. It's eight oh eight. Um, okay, so what have been some of the your favorite films discussed? Mm. Among the uh, among the board. Oh boy! Um, well, I I got one right off the bat. Go ahead. Still no, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, so we started our 2020 season with Angel at My Table, which was an Australian film, and then we did in February did this film called The Big City, which was from India, 1962, and it was uh, about um the changing family dynamics when the woman in the household goes into the job market right and um and then um because she's out of the house finally she also has new relationships with co-workers and customers and her boss and then um she finds herself dealing with her boss's racism against a co-worker mm -hmm. because oh, yeah. instead of, this woman is Anglo Indian. She's half Indian and half British, and the the boss doesn't like her. 
So anyways, the, the woman is uh, faced with, um, do, I, do I look after my um, economic safety by siding with the boss, or I do the right thing and, so, and side with my, my, my worker friend? You know, yeah. what Dan and I had been talking about before, oh, yeah. the, before we started was, it's the same theme as... Um, You're saying salt of the earth? Yeah, salt yeah. of the earth men and women working as equals and um, working class solidarity across racial lines. Right. And that that was, a, I love that Indian film, but the salt of the earth, that theme, that came out in the 50s and that theme was so troublesome to the United States government that the salt of the earth was, was blacklisted. Yeah and was hardly seen in its own time. Yeah. But since the authors, the, the creators didn't uh, re-up their, um, their trademark on it, um, it can be seen without paying royalties now. But um, the, it's very calm and subtle movie, but, the, but it's also very um, revolutionary, insurrectionist kind of. Yeah, right? oh, absolutely, it's very radical. Mes message. Mm. Um, I'm you, What's your film? Well, you, for the <laughs> picking one, Let's I know, right? One. <laughs> well, you know, it, it's funny. Um, I think probably for me it was uh, it was one of our virtual movie club movies. So we basically have two streams, you know. So we have the uh, the ones we show uh, at the Fire, Fire Museum, Museum. Uh, and that's uh, once a month, usually every third Thursday. I want to say third Thursday. Thir thir yeah. Anyway, and. Um, but we also have a virtual movie club, which is very much like a book club, you know, where the idea is that you watch a movie ahead of time and then we get together on Zoom, we chat about it. Right. And, uh, and it's kind of nice because, you know, this all started because of COVID. We were kind of stuck doing that. Um, and it turns out, you know, necessity was a good thing in this case because we found that we were able to have um, uh, just a, a more... Uh, thorough discussion where everybody's voices were heard because the nature of Zoom is, you know, we can't all be sitting at one table chatting with each other. So there's no crosstalk, you know, right. there's no conversations breaking off over here. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of nice. Uh, so the the one we did um, some time back was um, A Face in the Crowd, uh, which ah. is a, a black and white flick. Uh, it's very good. It's from, I want to say 56. It's uh, Eli Kazan. But it's uh, the star of it is Andy Griffith, um, and it's pre at the time he was largely known as a stand-up comedian, and he was he was very successful at that. He had a very funny bit these bits he would do, mm -hmm. where he played this uh, uh, country tent preacher explaining football. And uh, anyway, it's a long story. <laughs> but in this, <laughs> it's it's great. You uh, gotta watch it, right? You do. <laughs> you, you can find it on YouTube. It's great. Yeah. But um, the this film is really interesting because um, because Andy Griffith was basically an unknown quantity. It, the film he starts off very um, uh, very friendly and charismatic, and you, you kind of like the guy. He's a little bit of an underdog, but as he starts to accrue more power, because he starts to realize the um, uh, the incredible outsized influence that radio and then television can bring he becomes demagogic and it's a towering performance i know you think he's overacting but i, believe, I thought he was chewing the carpet i, I yeah. believe he's overacting because the character is an overactor not any well it's a long story so but he had, to, he had to be what the role demanded yeah he had to be this outsized character where he's he, where he's first he's playing the sort of southern caricature of you know the good old boy guy right. who, oh i'm just a country boy i don't know anything about all that and then by the end of it, he's this incredible tyrant. And it's I thought it was incredibly prescient to see that. Not not just because of just the fact that we have so much uh well, I mean, this for instance, you know, we're we're using a, you know, social media and, and that to uh so we're reaching a lot of people, but sometimes the influence can be outsized if somebody is skillful at manipulating things. Right. And so and of course, I mean I don't we have know. a we have an antagonist who turns, into, or excuse me, a protagonist who turns into an antagonist. Very much so. And when you watch that progression happen in the film. Yeah. A Face in the Crowd. A Face in the Crowd. I mm -hmm. can't yeah. recommend it more highly. It's one of my all-time favorites. Jasmine is here. She says, hello, Helen. Is that Jasmine Harpuga? Yes, that's, yep, that's our Jasmine. And Jose is here. That's my man. Good morning, Jose. 
and Michelle Gums. Good morning, Aurora. Hi there, Helen. Hi, Michelle. Helen got hit the claps for Helen. I'm, I'm hitting the claps for Helen. <laughs> Well, can I take this moment to point out we have Ooh. our our uh, web address here for there Aurora, it is right Aurora there. Film Society. Yep, we've also Just, got it in the chat. If you guys are interested, please <coughs> check them out, Aurora Film Society, and also follow you on Facebook as well here. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, yes. Facebook, the time is 8.15 a.m. So the webs, if you go to the website, you'll see the list of films we have in the virtual club, mm -hmm. the w list of films that we have uh at the fire museum the second story of the fire museum there's a little theater there okay it's stadium seating we've got a great sound system mm -hmm. and a nice screen and actually we just do it off the wall don't we uh yeah because we uh we expanded it so that we could we basically they, they we painted the wall uh so that you could project directly onto it because it was larger and that way so you'll see the lists you'll see the time um the times and also you know the um the Zoom link for joining the discussion yes. on the virtual. So, um, the month of June, our uh, film on the month, of, our live film on the month of June is "Women on the Verge of a Nervous Breakdown." It's a Spanish film by Almodovar. Yeah, and um, yes, the 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 mononymic yeah Almodovar. Uh, Almodovar and I'm yeah. I'm looking forward to August um, "Medium Cool" by yeah. Haskell Wexler. It's like a um, he it, he filmed it during the 1968 riots mm -hmm. in uh, downtown Chicago, uh, Chicago. Mm -hmm. yeah. and um, Democratic convention. Mm -hmm. it, well, mm -hmm. and he obviously didn't plan it, but right. he was shoot, <laughs> he was shooting the day it happened. So the story is it's um Rob the wonderful gone too soon Robert Forster mm -hmm. um, plays this newsman and. So he has his news character walking through actual history happening. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a neo realism thing, and um, yeah, you know, right? It yeah, is. It's very it, much but like by the, accident. And Haskell Wexler is a very um, uh, well. What we, should we say about Haskell Wexler? Politically, is a very, uh, in, um, left of center. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, but he was even filming. Um, in uh, more southern Illinois, when they were doing in the in the months leading up to the uh, the the convention, the police were doing all this training, and it's interesting to see how much access he got to them. First of all, and the way that the the police were the mind, the mentality that was being instilled in them by the leadership and by Mayor Daly was clearly like, hey, we're going to have a we're going to have a merry time of it busting a bunch of heads and you know yeah that's an actual historical record yeah yeah um, mm. it's it's very much i mean um i think one i can't remember what was the name of the commission uh but they said they referred to it in their investigation they referred to it as a police riot because it was yeah. the police mm -hmm. that were essentially rioting mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. at this moment i'd like to inject to the listeners there's an awesome book it's called boss Ooh. By was it Studs Terkel? Ooh. Mike Royko. Mike Royko, excuse oh, me. Yeah, right. it's yeah, by yeah. Mike Royko. It's called Boss, um, and it's about Mayor Daly. That book will change your life if you read it. It will show you the what word will I choose for this moment? Mm. Deplorable. It will show you. The, it will show you <laughs> the. Okay. It will show you the deplorable nature associated with. Chicago Politics and the Daily Machine at that time. Mm -hmm. Absolutely fantastic book by Mike Royko. Uh, we're out. here to talk about movies, not books. Time is 8, 18 a.m. <laughs> um, so here's the thing. Linda Mullenbach. Oh. Good morning to oh. you, Linda. Hi, Linda. Hello. Oh, y'all know Linda? Okay. I love the Mullies. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Everybody's tuning in. I love me oh, some Mullies. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, oh, there goes my pen. So here's the thing. I got a couple of, That's how I'm a couple of questions and genres here. Um, sure. And I'd like to, so I'm going to put out some genres, and I'd like for you guys to give me a fave or your fave of each of these genres of movies. Oh, oh boy. Helen, we'll start with you. Mm. Oh. Westerns. West, oh, Will Penny. Will Penny? Westerns. Yes. Is Will, that the name of the movie? Will Penny. Um, Charlton Heston was known for his big movies. Like Ben Hur and and uh, oh, yeah. the Ten Commandments, mm -hmm. yeah. but he did um, he did this very small, quiet western called Will Penny. That's the title. That's his name, uh, with Joan Hackett, and he's this 
whoopsies. Yeah, <laughs> He's this um, broken down old cowboy who never learned how to read and write. He never established a family um, because he was a cowpoke. And it's just a really sad, sweet movie. And it's different side of, I mean, we see Charlton Heston, remember him with my, take my gun over my dead body. and right. everything. That was Alzheimer's. That was not him. Right. I swear to you, it was not him because in the, in the you know, 50s, 60s, he was in the, he was marching in the civil rights uh, parades and things, and oh, yeah. he was great friends with, you know, those people. So I, I really feel so sorry that his career, our memory of him is ruined by how he behaved during, when he had Alzheimer's, because my mother was a, was a harridan. We were t frightened of her. When she had Alzheimer's, she became this little sweet lady, please and thank you and all sorts. My friend's mother was a sweet um, a kindergarten teacher and she became a knife wielding. <laughs> she would come, they had to hide the knives from her. So he became something terrible and I, I hate that his memory is ruined by that. But Will Penny, I really, it's just... It's good fun. It's completely out of what you expect from from uh, Charlton Heston. All right, Will Penny. I've got that on my list. I've got that on my list. Mm -hmm. um, Dan, before you give your answer, Dan, sure. Linda says, good morning, Dan. What a wonderful surprise to see you here. Oh. Glad to hear that. Thank you, Linda. Tracy Duran, good morning to you, friend. Mm -hmm. All right, Dan. Glad to be surprising. Mm -hmm. isn't it? Western. Uh, well, I think probably for me, the, the, the classic one, uh, which um, my uh, partner on my podcast and I and my friend Nick, uh, we always say Real Bravo, uh, which is uh, John, Wayne, John Wayne, Dean Martin, uh, Walter Brennan, and uh, Ricky Nelson, actually. <laughs> and it does, in oh, fact, sorry. have a musical note. No, it's fine. It's it's a but it's an odd rogues gallery, but it's I think, <laughs> to me it's one of the great. Uh, it's it's Howard Hawks, and it's one of the great westerns. It doesn't necessarily have a huge like amount of subtext unless you're really looking for it it's not like a super heavy one but it's a great action film and it's a great buddy film um and i would say probably the most beautiful looking western is one by john ford it's called my darling clementine just one well you could go no, on and no, on and I, on I, I, this guy knows every movie that was ever made I, I like he, how he just threw that in there too he just seamlessly went from two yeah. See, this is a, all good. This is a, this is a running. Yeah, this is a problem though. I, I have this problem too. It's all right. It's all right. But my darling Clementine, beautiful movie. <laughs> okay. My darling Henry Clementine, Henry Fonda. Oh, it's okay. yep, Henry Fonda. It's it's the it's a wider movie, but it's not like a big macho gung ho movie. It's right. just very beautiful. Okay. Yep. All right. So that's those are westerns. Dan Barrero is here. Good morning to you, Dan. Good to see you. Good morning, Aurora, and happy Monday. Right back at you. The time is eight twenty-three. We're here with our friends Helen Raslow and Dan Jeremy Brooks of the Aurora Film Society. All right. Um, that was westerns. Mm. Drama. The oh drama my movie. God. Oh boy. Um. Oh. I'll say anything by John Sayles. <laughs> it was just, it, yeah, Helen and I are... We're um, both John Sayles fans. Oh, we are huge fanboys of John Sayles, and Helen's about the only person I know, and I know a lot of film fans, but you're about the only person I know who feels, who's as big into John Sayles movies as, as me. Yeah, and I couldn't pick, it's like, you know, you have children, you can't pick your favorite child. That's I terrible to say. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think, I don't know if I can pick my favorite John Sayles okay. movie. Yeah. But he's, well. um, I love him because um, he often has um, a multiracial casting, which mm -hmm. I think is so important in our society today. Yeah. And he, um, and the stories braid in and out of each other and creates um, a an atmosphere of whatever. Also, he is just a year younger than me, so it sure. seems like wherever he is in life, that's pretty much where I am at too. Okay. So, um, yeah. Um, Any John Sayles movie? Sorry, I stole your John Sayles. No, no, no. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do John Sayles too. I'm, no, okay. Are you gonna pick a favorite? I am. I'm gonna go with City of Hope, which yeah. um, unfortunately is. I hate to pick it because it's a little bit of a perverse choice because it's the only one of his films which is not available on DVD and but it really can, rankles you can, me. You can, you can rent it on YouTube. Oh, good. Okay, well then that at least. But uh, that's probably, I think, his. Well, he he's got several masterpieces. In fact, Helen and I were just in the city uh, last. 
Saturday or two Saturdays ago to see uh, another film of his, Maidawan, at the Gene Siskel Center. But his, my favorite films of his, like City of Hope and Maidawan and uh, Eight Men Out and Lone Star and uh, uh, Silver City and all those, they're all very much like Helen saying. There's, there's all these. Every strata of society is represented, and a lot of it is given equal time. There isn't necessarily one main character. Uh, sometimes you can see, like you said, the way they braid in and out with each other, and it's every every you know all genders, classes, uh, uh, races, and every power. The whoever has the most power and who has the least, and how they reflect and interact with each other in ways they don't even realize. Where somebody's oh, this guy's brother-in-law ended up. Uh, you know, uh, doing this thing to some kid on the street, and this has an effect on what happens in the city for the you know the rest of the movie or whatever. I mean, that's a weird analogy, but yeah. I, I know it's your turn, but I I, I love in <laughs> sorry, I, go ahead. I love in City of Hope where the there's a a, a, a schizophrenic oh, yes. street man who becomes like the the town crier. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. So he's like the lowest of the low, but he's very integral to the to the yeah. story. How, yeah, how it rolls out. Oh, very much. And the fact that they even give him as much screen time as they do, uh, considering he almost speaks entirely in just just uh, lines he's gotten from from television commercials. He's just repeating back, you know, uh, commercials for uh, uh, appliance stores and stuff. And and yet at the same time, they give him his dignity. Uh, and I think that's something I'd say about sales is that even the most um, loathsome characters are not fully evil. They they are. They have their reasons, and you can kind of get it. I mean, even you know, like like for instance, when we saw Mater Wan recently, there's you know, I mean, Baldwin Feltz, uh, the Baldwin Feltz group was uh, basically these guys that were hired to go out to um, bust, uh, the union. bust unions, and they right. were some of the most loathsome villains who ever lived. I mean, these guys would shoot machine guns into tents with women and children in them, and they thought it was all hilarious. They right. put the word "death special" on the side of their car because I mean, they were. Honestly, I mean, despicable. Hell was yeah. invented for these dudes, Yet, and even in that, even in Madewan, there is one guy who's like, I didn't really know what I signed up for. I just got here because I answered a, ma a, a, a newspaper ad. <laughs> yeah. So there's a little bit of humanity, at least in that one guy, you know. And that's true of John Sayles' movies, I'd say. Mm -hmm. yeah. William Miller the Third is here, ladies and gentlemen. He's a friend of the show. Happy first full week of June. Thank you, sir. Oh. And John Schomer is here. Good morning to you. John Schomer, times 8.27 a.m. All right, so that was drama, love, romance. Mm. Oh, dang. Mm. A romance movie. What is a romance movie that you guys mm. love? <gasps> a romance movie every person should see at least once. I, I, oh, dear. No, no, no. I, I have a hard time with Everybody that because... Everybody can one, right? <laughs> no, I have a hard time with that because I tend towards... My taste tends towards the grim. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we've, we've sort of got the, you know. I, like you say. We've got the yeah, bridge and the river quiet in the back of our minds, like Jean-Pierre Melville says. You know? Or, or uh, yeah, fire on the plains. Fire on the plains, <laughs> yes. Fire on the plains? No, no, oh, that's, no, no not, that's, that's, that's not actually, a rom-com. Yeah, that's, that's a war That's film. grim. <laughs> but, it, 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 but it's a that's very, a uh, it's, it's a very not. Uh, oh, it's so grim. It, it is. It's one of those war films where um, there's only a couple war films I can think of where all the exhilaration is completely drained out of it, and yeah. you've just seen it for the horror it is, and that's one of them I'd say. But anyway, we're not. But anyways, about that. Yeah. A, you can think of a rom com. Um, that I mean, you a, like? a, well, or a romance. I mean, I I think um, I actually really like um, I really like Jerry Maguire. Actually, okay. I, I think Jerry Maguire is a very oh, okay. surprisingly heartfelt film. I think. Um, Cameron Crowe, I mean, he also directed Say Anything, which is one of my favorites as well. So, I mean, I think it's no accident that he's written and directed a couple of the ones I consider the most romantic, but realistic. You know what I mean? It's, it's, not, uh, it's not all, you know, harps and flowers uh, in the last act. You know, There's a lot of growing pains in Jerry Maguire. Very much so, yeah. yeah. At um, least for the main character. Yeah, true. Yep. I will say the most romantic thing I ever heard was, um, you know who Jimmy Durante is? The singer, uh, he was a vaudeville performer, he's a comedian. Yeah. Uh, he had the schnozzle, he used to call it, you know. Okay. He sounded like this, you know, that kind of guy. Okay, yeah. He, um, he and his first wife, um, when they went on their honeymoon, they went to uh, Calabasas, California. And she died very young. I can't remember 
what it was, but he used to perform um, music. Uh, he would sing in his very inimitable way, which was very beautiful. So he would do concerts, and at the end of each concert, he would say, um, Good night, Mrs. Calabash, wherever, wherever you are. Wherever you are, and oh yeah. Because she used to mispronounce Calabash, County as Calabash. And he used to do that every night, even after he remarried, other decades later, he would still, he had that little little thing he did for his, for his, his late wife. And I think that's one of the most romantic things. You right. know? I get a little, mm, yeah. just think about it, actually. Even yeah. though it's not a movie. No, it's not a movie. Yeah. But it is a gesture, I would say, it was pretty, pretty awesome. I, so. I guess, um... I, I don't I can't think of anything in particular, but I just popped in my head. I did like the the romance, even though it's sad in Moulin Rouge. Mm, okay. <laughs> and I remember I, my my son went to that movie with me, and when uh, that was Sarah, your younger son. Yeah, my yeah. younger son, and I. So um, it's fa failed faded love because the woman dies, and. Um, I look over and see my beautiful son, my big hairy beast son there crying, <laughs> crying. And it's like, I think I, I love the movie because it touched him yeah. so much. Not necessarily because it was a great movie, but just that he was touched by it. Mm, okay. That's why I remember that. Moulin Rouge. Yeah. It is All a right. good film. Yeah. It is a good film. Mm -hmm. It's what's kind of wild and crazy but yeah. Leo Zarco's here good morning to you Leo good to oh. see you hey, here Leo, sir yeah, Leo. hey Leo Leo what's up Leo's Howdy. got friends on the show oh, yeah. Leo's got, friends, got friends all over oh yeah yeah he does yeah he's a great guy he is he's a great guy yeah um so his poetry ah. is really good he brought some of his poetry on when we had him on the show oh really and read some of it to us and that was actually um that was something that was really good to do to have a person actually because you know how it is when you're interviewing a person they're telling us what it is they do and why they do it. If you're asking a state representative, that's one thing. Sure. But to ask a poet who brought his poetry to read it live to you, that was mm -hmm. fantastic. Yeah, that, that is it great. Really was. I, I just like seeing more poetry just out there in the world in general, mm -hmm. you know, in the mainstream. So now here's Michelle Gums. She says, I like The Notebook mm. and I love the movie Five Feet Apart. Talks about your love and the power of human touch. I yeah. saw the notebook, and I remember after hearing, you know, I, I heard it was, but I watched it. It's a good movie. Mm -hmm. Holy cow, the notebook is a good movie. You know, I haven't like, really good. I've never seen it, but I, I like. Uh, is that Nicholas, I like, Nicholas Sparks? Yeah, uh, it was I don't a, know. Who, that's the book. The uh, author, yeah. But it was uh, Ryan Gosling and uh, Rachel McAdams, who I thought were actually a really cute couple. It's you a know? good cast. Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. so it's a good, it's a good movie. Uh, Tracy Duran says, I like The Notebook as well and the original. Okay, now I was going to get to that, Tracy. Hold on. Tracy said something that I don't want to preview it. <laughs> it's 8.32. we got to go to a commercial real quick. So let me do that. Let me go to a commercial. i got to give you guys a piece of news that I'm actually happy to tell you about. And then we'll come back to what Tracy Duran mentioned here. Um, so real quick, guys. Two pieces that are going to benefit you very well. Don't forget the 15th annual uh, Community Health Fair. Is coming up on June 11th. The Kane County Health Department, in partnership with the Aurora African American Health Coalition and Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Illinois, is proud to sponsor the 15th annual Health Fair Healthy Mind, Body, and Soul on Saturday, June 11th from 9 a.m. to <coughs> noon at the Prisco Center. Panel C Prostate Specific Antigen and BMI Body Mass Index will all be uh, screened there mm -hmm. for free. Um, there are these are no cost health screenings, pre registration, and an eight hour fast is required. Uh, I will have Maria put the um, website in the chat for you guys. I had a highlighter. Where'd the highlighter go? Is there a highlighter over there? Uh, no, nope. not seen This it. highlighter is the most ridiculous thing. Here you go, uh, Maria. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, there's that. Now, here's the other thing I was telling you about. We are one of many great drop-off locations for Father's Day toiletry items, mini size stuff. Uh, dad needs shaving razors. He needs shaving mm. cream. He needs deodorant. Your dad don't have deodorant. I feel sorry for you. <laughs> you got a dad like I used to have. Just come in the house and <laughs> hug you right after doing the lawn, you know? Just mow the lawn and, oh, come here. Like, Dad. Take a shower or something. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Marie Wilkinson's Food Pantry, 834 North Highland Avenue is a location. State Representative Barbara Hernandez's office is a location. 540 West Galena Boulevard. That's the intersection of 
May and Galena. State Farm Office at 2003 Montgomery Road, Suite 101. And Good Morning Aurora here, 5 East Downer Place, Suite T in Aurora. Uh, and we have the, you can reach out to our friend Christina Campos at the pantry. And I will give this to Monet as well so she can put that in the chat for you as well. The time is 8.35 a.m. You are listening to and watching Good Morning Aurora, the second largest city's first daily news podcast. We're here with our friends Helen Ratzlow and Dan Jeremy Brooks of the Aurora Film Society. Linda Mullenbach says, Dan, I can't believe you haven't seen The Notebook. You have to see it. Damn, they call you out, bro. I, they do. Call and, you out, bro. You know, but only your good <laughs> friends can do that. You know what I mean? You're only, you know they're good friends when they humiliate you in public. Right. You know? <laughs> yeah, I'm getting a little bit. They do it out of love. That's right, all it right. is. Uh, yeah. I, I should watch it. Um, I, you know, my parents loved it. I remember, you know, my dad and mom really cried when they watched and you know i'm a big crier of movies too i mean you and i talk oh, about yeah. that you know i cry at everything movies I, plays I, music commercials art. oh commercials sure yeah the one you cry on commercials sometimes oh, sure yeah. with that coffee commercial when the woman smells coffee in the kitchen she comes home her son has come home from the army oh yeah yeah, yeah. i cry like a baby oh, okay. that, that was a good yeah, yeah. sounds like a tear jerk i cry like well a yeah baby. that that was intended to to wring our tears yeah. from us i know? hate coffee but I, I love, you know. <laughs> wow that's effective why you don't even drink coffee and they got you. <laughs> that is a that is a but let me just say about mm -hmm. your your sweaty your sweaty dad hugging you <laughs> i think i think that's w wonderful that you had a dad who hugged you Oh yeah, mm -hmm. it is. Not it everybody is. has that. It is. I, I am. Uh, Even if he was sweaty. Yeah, I am very blessed. Yeah, I, I, think, I am very blessed. Did he do it on purpose to gross you out? <laughs> yeah, you know how dads do. I mean, yep. I, I do it to my son now. You know, when he's when he's all nice and he's playing with the uh, Lego Star Wars. Sure. Just come interrupt the whole thing because it's not just the hug; it's the interruption. Mm. and all that mm. and it's that feeling that comes over you when you're doing something else like you're cooking mm. and then you just look at your, your son or daughter and you want to like them. It yeah exactly mm -hmm. that's what it is so it's, it's one of those things when you're a you know there's that old I can't say adage or a meme now but mm. you turn into your parents oh god <laughs> you turn into your parents oh and, yeah and when you're young you think that they're just out of touch. They don't know what the hell's going on. But when you have kids and you get older, you realize like, you know what? Maybe the old man wasn't, maybe he wasn't so crazy. You know, maybe he was just trying to help me out. Yeah, it's it's like that Mark Twain quote where he says, I don't, I don't know if I have the ages right, but he says, yeah, when I was 16, I knew that my dad was a complete fool, but by the time I reached 30, I was amazed at how much he had learned in that time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Mark Twain. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right, Michael Rayford is here. Good morning, Michael Rayford. Chris Decker Mendoza, good morning to you as well. All right, now Tracy Duran prefaced it. Mm, yes. So let's go into this. Your favorite or the best musical? Oh, oh boy. boy. Oh darn, I have two. Go See, for it. You, now hold See, on, Helen, because no, no, no. you told him. I'll have Thank you. you. Okay, Thank you well, for, I'll, I'll pick I'm glad one. You're seeing I'll, this. Pick yes. one. I'll pick one. Oh, yes. Are you, uh, you don't have to. You can do two. I don't mind. If I do two, you can. Okay. No, but I don't really like musicals that much. So I'll okay, just do one. so I'll just. Okay. Mm. All right. So you can do so two and I'll do one. One of them, I love. Um, uh, Carmen Hip Hopera with Beyonce and Mackay Pfeiffer. Okay. Oh, I, I, there's this, they do this rap duet that's just pure genius. Okay. I, I love it. Carmen the acting, the acting isn't great because except for Mackay Pfeiffer, everybody is not an actor. They're like a musician themselves. Um, so the acting isn't great, but the, the that, that one rap duet just makes it for me because it's just okay. pure genius. Yeah. The other one is like a complete opposite, and that is Flower Drum Song. Uh. It's a it's a about um, Chinese uh, population in um, San Francisco, and there's the the older generation that's very traditional, and then there's the Americanized generation, and I like it uh, because it it's sweet. It's a very sweet story. Um, they make an, there's this Americanized man, he's got his Americanized girlfriend, but um, his family arranges a very traditional marriage 
a woman, woman coming over from China. Right. And he ends up falling in love with the traditional, the sweet traditional girl instead of the wild, crazy American girl. <laughs> but the other reason I like it is because on Broadway, it was white actors with eye makeup on. Mm -hmm. But when they made it into a film, it was entirely Asian actors in the Asian parts. And this was a first, mm -hmm. you know, because they'd have the cowboy movies and the Indians would be like shaved Italians. Right. Right. Sure. Yeah, sure. So, but It'll so this was, you know, America <laughs> starting to grow up. Um, mm. And there's some just some f beautiful fun songs and Miyoshi Yumeki uh, mm. was adorable and uh, James Shigeta was a oh, yeah. uh, you know a, a an American I think he was like second or third generation Japanese American and he was he was a crossover star he he became mm -hmm. you know kind of a heartthrob mm -hmm. you know out of out of like an Asian milieu so i that's a fun sweet story and lots of good songs and um uh, and uh care oh i think james hong was in it <laughs> really <laughs> we were just talking about james hong james is like hong. holds the record for being in the most feature films or james something. hong has been in like 450 movies or yeah lee van cleef uh yes. he's, he definitely he's up there okay. i mean them and uh and then eric roberts i think has been in like 600 movies or something wow. really i just read this the other day i was oh, like wow yeah. Victor, eric roberts, but anyways yeah. yeah it's uh it's a great great asian um american actors and one Japanese actress and mm. and uh, telling their story themselves, you know, not someone else telling their story. Right. So yeah, yeah, that's powerful. Yeah, you know. I like it. What you got, Dan? Uh, you know, it's one of the first movies I ever saw, um, and uh, it's always been a, a favorite. It's uh, Fiddler on the Roof. Uh, I'm oh, a big fan. Okay. Yeah. So and I, I think love that. oh yeah, Fiddler great on the music, roof. great music, and great stories. It's a, it's funny because there's a lot of a lot of musicals tend to fall on the comic side, I think, because there's a certain unreality to breaking into song out in the middle of nowhere, you know. But Fiddler on the Roof, the, the film, Norm Jewison's film, it's one of those rarities where it feels like you actually are living in a period piece like, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, Tsarist Russia, if you will, uh, on the, you know, right at the beginning of the pogroms. And, but it feels very authentic, and yet there's also this very, um, huge score and huge songs that everybody knows a lot of the songs from even if they don't haven't seen the movie they're like oh yeah i guess i know that one you know yeah so i would say that one's probably my favorite i'm not a, actually that big a musical fan uh i've never seen it oh it's 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 great i've never it's seen good. Fiddler on the roof okay uh, yeah i think it was and, like and yeah. topol is uh, yes pretty i mean he's Yes. Bigger, bigger than life. Oh yes, he very much so. Huge. He's yeah. Huge. Oh yeah. He is. He is a. He's one of those guys that plays far from the cameras. I say. You know. It's, I I grew up on all those musicals though. Kiss Me, Kate, and mm -hmm. uh, and uh, oh the Saint the Frank Sinatra ones. Oh, uh, on the town. I know you like that one. On right? the town. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or. Um, yeah. Christian yeah. Duran says, I love Fiddler on the Roof. Also, the jazz singer with Neil Diamond. You're going to say something right here? Nice. Yes. Um, Oliver Twist. Ah. Have you guys seen Oliver Twist? Yes, mm -hmm. I have. I My do like goodness. that. It is amazing. That and is. Of course, Hamilton. Oh, I love Hamilton. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. yeah. Michelle Scum says, I love Fame and the Wiz. Singing oh. in the Rain. Oh, Singing in the Rain. The yeah. yeah. The Wiz Same. was, uh, the Wiz for me is, is a, <laughs> like that movie that brought hope mm. so like when i was a kid um and for those who don't know the wiz it's the african-american version of the wizard of Oz. when i was a kid that was a major thing like parents were taking their kids to see that because you know i i was i was um i was born in 1982 mm. um so the lack of positive representation of African Americans in film was still a big thing sure. then. And I remember my <clears throat> mom, my parents, and all the parents, my, like that, we were forcing us <laughs> to watch The Wiz. <laughs> like when The Wiz came on TV, it was shut up, come on, sit up, sit down. And it, it was one of those, uh, one of those things, one of those movies. You know, it's it's funny. I I don't know if I've seen the film, but I saw um, high school production when I was really young, and I really liked it. Okay. And yeah. I remember at the time. I realize now, like, wow, that was kind of a 
big damn deal that some local high school was putting that on. You know, mm -hmm. I just thought it was fun because I'm like, oh, the Ruby Re Rebox. You know, that's that's yeah. funny. You know, so it's only later <laughs> on, bless you. It's only later on that you I realize how again it's so to be represented and to be able to represent yourself, like you were saying about Flower Drum Song. I mean, it's so powerful. Linda Mullenbach says, the sound of music. Yeah. Good, oh, one, uh, good, good one, that's a good one. Too. Oh, and fighting Nazis to boot. Exactly, yeah. exactly. It's win-win. Uh, I love yeah. I love seeing, I love it when they shoot the Nazis, that's all yeah. I'm saying. You know, we're I'm looking at, see now, when you're when when you are older, you look at that. You know, when yes. I was a kid watching that, I was like, "What's the significance of this?" You know? Right. Oh yeah. <laughs> so funny story. Um, my my gal uh, Heidi Heidi Wetzel and I went to see the sing along Sound of Music at the Music Box a few years ago. Mm -hmm. They do it every Christmas, I think. And we're driving there, and she's like, "Oh yeah," she's naming all the songs, and I'm like. Yeah, I don't know if I remember those. And I realized I hadn't seen the movie since I was like five. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, oh, yeah, that's the one where, you know, where it's, uh, you know, expialidocious. Isn't that in there? And she's like, no, that's not, you know, she's just <laughs> like, so pretty soon I'm kind of poking her. I'm like, oh, isn't that the one that's got, you know, and I'm, I'm naming stuff from My Fair Lady or whatever. Yeah, and she's, yeah. you know, she's, you know, getting ready to pull. Oh, right, isn't that? You know, she's going to pull the car over and just, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But anyway, but we went and saw it and it was a very fun experience to do it yourself sing along mm -hmm. sound of music but i hadn't seen it since i was like five so yeah but i do i do love the nazi stuff you know that's so so fascinating it's so poignant yep mm. it's, um it's eight four i'm sorry i mean i cut you off ellen go ahead oh no i'm taking us off on a tangent if you've got a because you have there's genres you haven't asked us about yet mm. but uh, i i will take us on one tangent go ahead, if you don't yeah. mind yeah. because when i'm dating myself but this yeah. dates me anyhow um I saw Lawrence of Arabia. Oh, yeah. oh I, Peter O'Toole. Yep. I was I was fourteen, oh. so I watched Ooh. this film, and um, I was like, "What a hero! What a man! What a guy!" Then I didn't see it again till oh, I yeah. was like thirty six years old. I saw it again, and I said, "Oh man, that poor kid! They really messed him over." Ooh. You know, so it's still it was still a great film, though. It is. It's an absolutely magnificent film. Mm -hmm. I think I I don't. Well, I I've seen it five times. I'm not going to see it again. It's it's too long. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a long. It's yeah, it's but, four um, hours long or four. four? I, four I, I don't long, yeah. I don't think it Depending aged. The DVD, it's in two DVDs. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah, yeah yes, I don't exactly. think it aged well. I I think some of the casting is in is kind of. Well, the, the, yeah, that, that movie. But that movie, overall, it's a great movie. But I'm yeah. saying it was still a great movie, even though I was seeing it from a. Two different vantage right. points. It is a great movie. The thing about that, which highlights kind of the what we've been talking about, is um, for the type of production that it was. I mean, you had Anthony Quinn, right. fantastic actor. He Absolutely. was playing uh, Abu Abu Tayyip. Mm -hmm. So you had white guys playing Arab characters. Right. That's why and, I think it didn't age. Of, of course. Yeah, so, yeah. so so yes, it did not. It's full of cringe. Mm -hmm. It's full of cringe. Sure. The only two black dudes in it get killed. Oh, it's full yeah. of cringe. Um, yeah. However, God. however, in the classic element of filmmaking, visual production, I mean, the scene where Gassim is walking through the desert and he falls out before Peter O'Toole goes to save him. Oh, um, my God. The scenery of uh, British occupied Egypt. Yep. General Allenby, you can't beat it. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, but yeah. it's full of cringe. However, the time is 8.48 a.m. Yes. This is the episode that flew... We didn't get none of these. Damn. This is this we happens to us. We oh, got to do a part two. This, oh, is, this is this is crazy. You we don't have just... time for another genre. Helen, <laughs> we don't have time. No, no, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta steer this ship in a correct. We might have time. We might have to. Let me, let me. You do what you need to do. Okay. We understand. This is a problem in interviewing people like you guys who know what you're talking about. This is <laughs> <laughs> this is a good conversation, but the time is getting away with us. Oh yeah. Um. Okay. So. Currently, and for anyone who wants to join and find out about the Aurora Film Society, right. how do they get involved? Sure. Uh, well, this is one way. Okay. Right. Or just come by the um, Fire Museum. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I, third Thursday. Oh, look it up. Look it up. Yeah. Andy Quinn was Mexican. Thank you very much, Peter Aguilera. You're he, was right. he was Mexican and yes, Irish. He was, white. Right. he was Mexican Irish. Right. Oh, Quinn. Hence he the was. Quinn. Ah. Yes, hence the Quinn. Right. That's right. Thank you, Peter. There's a lot of Mexican Irish oh. out there, actually. That's a huge overlap. Yeah. So. Oh, He's there's Arab. Actor too. There's Arab oh, Mexicans. Yeah. There's, there's a Chinatown in every country there is in the yeah. world. 
I was in Leon, Nicaragua, and ran across the Chinatown. You were telling yeah. me about that. I yeah. remember that. Um, yeah, I mean, for instance, our, our well, the next... The date. Do you have the date? Right, yeah. Our next episode, or next uh, showing is uh, 623. Yeah. So uh, the 23rd of this month, and we're showing uh, Women on the Verge of a Nervous Breakdown, which is the mode of our film. And the virtual movie club is the Thursday prior to that, which is the 16th. Ooh, Throne of Blood. Throne of Blood. And, Throne of uh, Blood. It's Japanese. Great It's film. a Japanese take on the Macbeth story. Yeah. Ooh. With the with the wonderful, great, oh, that's gotta be good. amazing it's, it's Toshiro incredible. Mifune. Okay. And it's, yeah, it's directed by Akira Kurosawa, who's my all-time favorite director. And uh, it's an absolutely stunning movie, visually speaking. Uh, and it, that's on the 16th, which is my birthday. So that's kind of fun. Yay! So my favorite and director on my birthday. Okay. So if the person goes to the website, they will get the password to join the Zoom. Right. Okay. Uh, right. I should also say, though, that um, because of COVID, we only did the first two months of 2020. And then, you know, when March happened and the, as I called yeah. the, the recent unpleasantness, you know, right. happened, you know. So 2022, we right. picked up where we left off in 2020. Right. So in the film we were going to show March 2020, we showed March 2022. So the rest of this year, we're finishing off what we had planned to do right. in 2020. So, it, well, I was going to say, anybody who is a member already and paid up, you're fine. You can keep coming. And anybody, honestly, for the rest of this year, anyone who'd like to come out and try it for a couple months, that's totally fine. We are not really looking to collect money for the rest of the year. We're just trying to kind of grow our membership back after, as I say, mm -hmm. the recent unpleasantness. All right, come yeah. on and get involved with our friends of the Aurora Film Society. Mm -hmm. Okay, Helen, genre, let's do it. We can do it. It's all good. Let's do it. What you want to do? Talk, the floor is yours, Helen. It's 851. You got till 858. Mm -hmm. The floor is yours. Well, I was thinking we should do sci-fi. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes, we can. Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. fix one, 1138. We already showed that. True that. Great. Yeah. Uh, this is my guilty pleasure. I love Johnny Mnemonic. Oh, yeah. yeah. Even though Keanu Reeves hated it. His own movie, but I love it. That's a, that's it's a like great movie. He, <clears throat> I love that movie. Yeah, yeah I mean, Jared. it's got it's got a um, a the computer is the computer assist is done by a porpoise. Yes, who lives in yes. a tank named and, Jones. Remember yeah. <laughs> <Johnny laughs> that Jones? Yeah. Uh, yeah, and Henry Rollins is Henry in it. Henry Rollins, yeah, and uh, Dolph Lundgren, who's actually quite a good actor, although he rarely gets the chance to he show was it. The first Punisher. He was. He was. He was, he was yeah. indeed. And in this, he's very, he's the villain, but is also very comedic. He, he does a good job of, of kind of playing it a little little light yeah. at times. But it also has a, a message about um, how, uh, how we live and how it's poisoning us and making us sick. True, um, true. And uh, I love, that's my guilty pleasure uh, sci-fi. I don't. Uh, I don't believe in guilty pleasures. I just have things that I like that almost nobody else does. Okay, what do you? <laughs> What's your sci-fi? Oh God, uh, I'm a huge fan of sci-fi. Um, so it's hard to narrow it down. Um, there is a film that came out just a few years ago, and I'm, I'm going to kind of uh, just kind of sub for that a little because it's not overly well known outside of film fans. It's a film called Primer. And it was shot for basically no money in, I think in 2006, it was one of those things where um, the, the guy who did it, he wrote, directed, he did the cinematography, he acted it, he, he wrote the music, he edited it, and oh, something else. I mean, I guess he produced it as well. And he did it for so <laughs> little money that they would have to rehearse uh, for a while and then they would shoot one take because he couldn't afford more than one take for celluloid. So, you know, and it's very tech uh, oriented, but in a way that if you don't understand any of that stuff, it doesn't matter because this, the story is also about this friendship between these two guys and how technology, like in the case of Johnny Mnemonic, it can kind of um, warp or destroy us if we're not careful. And it's so it's a time travel flick, but it's done on with almost no special effects that I can think of. and. Mm -hmm. And also, it, because a lot of it at the beginning takes place where it's these four guys uh, in their garage trying to do a startup, they're all tech guys, and just some of this tech speak and all, all the, the shorthand between them reminds me so much of growing up uh, with um, my brother and my dad. Uh, my dad's an engineer and a total genius, 
And my brother is also a genius, uh, although not quite as technically savvy, but very savvy nonetheless. And I, I just remember being at the kitchen table and hearing those conversations between them and other people that would come over, friends or engineers or computer nerds back in the 80s when a lot of people didn't really own PCs right. yet. And they didn't even know what the word PC, what PC yeah. stood for, you know. And so Primer is very much like that. So it's a directed by Sean or Shane Carruth, and it's from 2006, I think. And it is just absolutely wonderful. Mm. And it shows you how you can do something beautiful and mind blowing without any money or special effects. I think it's seven thousand. Seven thousand. Primer, seven thousand. That was the budget. That is that's incredible. Seven thousand dollars. That's amazing. I mean, that's insane because. Trying to make a movie for seven thousand dollars thirty years earlier would have been insane. You right. know what I mean? And, and like that in in the money for that time is it's incredible, yeah. and um, uh, and it's a very it, like it has people people love it. It's a it's a very short film. It's only like seventy some minutes, and like fans love to talk about it. like, well, do you think it means this at this point? And you know, because there's all these weird time loops. So if you go on the Wikipedia page, you'll find like charts people have made where they're like, well, this time he goes back here. But wait, is this this version of him, or is it that? It's great, and it's just endlessly entertaining. Um, Susan Mazio, good morning. The time is 8.55 a.m. Wow, all right, so we got a few more minutes here. Um, so I asked you, we talked about genres, specifically. Let's end with just a good movie, so you guys will get the positive word of the day to give to folks as well. Mm -hmm. But let's also start with giving them a movie that you love. What's a movie that everybody should see, a movie or a film? Not necessarily what we've been talking about, genre specific, mm -hmm. but just overall. Mm. I'll give folks one. Go ahead. The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance. Right. <laughs> and that almost made my Western list. That's, uh, okay. that's in the top three or four for me. Yep. The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance. I'm going to give that one to the world. Plus when... it had a great song. It, it did. did. It did. Yep. I love that song. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> when Liberty <laughs> Valance came yeah. to town. Gene Pitney. Gene yeah. Pitney, yes. I love Gene Pitney. Great Pitney. song. Yeah. And uh, it also gives you that, that famous line, uh, when uh, the legend becomes fact, you print the legend. That's oh. right. And that is such a profound statement, especially for our times of disinformation and it is. willful misinformation it and, is. you know, uh, just communication. When garbling. I saw that scene, that made me love that movie. I loved it all, but that at the end, yes. he ripped the whole, he was like, yes, I was like, oh my God. God, he threw it in the fire. He did, and it's the, and he walked out. He did, yeah. It's a total oh. mic drop moment, and and you know, and Jimmy Stewart and his wife—I can't remember the wife, uh, the actor—but the look on their face at the end, that just that kind of despair of we're stuck forever playing this role. And and Jimmy Stewart in the film, he's clearly a good person. He yep. wants to do the right thing, and yet he's stuck in this sort of mm -hmm. social trap now you know and his entire <clears throat> life is kind of going to be about that yeah. movie you should see mm. uh, battle of algiers oh yeah Ooh, great film. Yep. battle of algiers it's a first it, italian neorealism style which means that there's only a few professional actors mm -hmm. and most people are playing a version of themselves mm -hmm. and it's about the algerians fight to throw off um french colonial rule that's right that's and great um book. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, no, when we showed it, um, a lot of times we would go out and uh, discuss the movie afterwards. When we showed it at our at our, our film society, everyone was so stunned, they just went back straight home. Yeah, I don't it's, think a lot it's, of... It's, it's, um, I told you, my, my tr taste tends towards the grim. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it is a very, very serious film, but it's yeah, and I also a don't good think a film. Lot of, a lot of people, that was the 50s, I think that was from 1951 to 1954, and the French committed atrocious war crimes. Oh, absolutely. Which I don't believe a lot of the people know that and they were French And they were still the French were still trying to hold on to their colony in, yep. in Indochina, which we now know as Vietnam. Absolutely. And, um, so it was the, the end of the French Empire yep. as, yeah. as these people started fighting back and claiming their own land. Well, in the in the very first scene is such a arresting scene. It's they've just gotten done waterboarding this guy, this poor guy, and they're you know they've already gotten all the information. They're like, oh, see, you know, why don't you just give us the information at in the beginning? You could have avoided all that. And you see, yeah, you can see the the imperialist roots of a lot of these forms of torture. Um, you know, uh, like Heidi said the other day that um, the Americans actually invented waterboarding during the uh, 
uh, occupation of the Philippines after, uh, after the yeah. Spanish American War. So it's it's funny to see these quote first world countries and behaving funny, like ha, this. Ha, no, not funny, ha ha. Funny like horrifying, you know. Right. And that that movie is really a good way to to show that because at the time I don't know if they really had gotten their independence yet, or had they maybe just because it was the very, Algerians. Yeah. No, they hadn't. Charles de Gaulle. Yes. Famous and revered from World War II. Absolutely. Was the big stickler in the whole thing. Um, fantastic history. Fantastic oh, God, yeah. history. All right. So the time is 9 o'clock. Uh oh. Mm-hmm. Um, you still have to give us your movie that everybody should see. Okay. I'll just do it really fast. Akira Kurosawa, again. Uh, it's probably it's my favorite film by him and definitely my top five. It's called Ikiru, which okay. is Japanese for to live. And it's about um, a civil servant who is, I think, in his 50s or 60s, and he suddenly learns he's dying of cancer and he only has a few months to live. And I, all, all this I'm telling you is literally explained in the first scene before we even meet the character the narrator tells you. Um, and it's about how this guy realizes he's been living this life of this sort of petty bureaucrat and he hasn't lived, if you will. And so he makes it his mission for the last few months to accomplish this very, what seems a very small thing, uh, which is to build a playground uh, in the area near where he lives. And because he's a lifelong bureaucrat, he understands all the ins and outs, and he knows all the people involved. And so every time he's stymied, he finds a way to kind of get around them. And a lot of it has to do with just his sheer determination and the fact that he knows time is short. And it's an absolutely beautiful film. It's called Ikiru. It's from Ooh, 1951, mm-hmm. and uh, it was one of Kurosawa's films that he made that was set in modern day. This was in Tokyo, uh, post-war, and he felt, I think, that it was his best film. Mm. But unfortunately, he found that his uh, his samurai films and his period pieces, the uh, uh, Aigo Geki, I can't remember if that's how you say it, but... Uh, those were the more popular ones, you right. know, like Yojimbo, Seven Samurai, which are beautiful films. And I mean, Ron. Ron. Ron yes, is Ron, amazing. Yeah, uh, all those. I mean, Throne of Blood is definitely uh, feudal Japan, you know, uh, during what, you know, Japan would kind of consider its medieval period, you know. Um, but this is one of his um, films set at the time it was filmed, and it's beautiful. You know? All right. Um, so the show ends on a positive note. What is your message today? For the people of Aurora going into this week and Monday. Mm. Come join us. Mm. Come join us and watch good movies. Mm. I mean, these are curated. We we don't just throw out any old movie. We we think about this, what we're gonna what we wanna show. And I personally think the film has a, a great deal of power yeah. to to um change society. To show because um, I mean, we have a lot of post-apocalyptic stories right now because there's this generalized angst we have about where the human race is going. But we could be doing something else. We could be showing how, um, like this working-class solidarity cross racial lines. Right. There are movies like that, and that's what we need right now to ch- to turn this country around. Yeah, I agree. Um, I, I would say. Um... You know, Roger Ebert once said that film is the greatest machine for producing empathy and compassion for others. And I, I think it's true. I mean, I, I know Vladimir Lenin said that uh, film is the greatest art form because of its power and, and it's so immediate. Um, but I would say if I had a message in general for people, I would say keep pressing on, which is what I always say. And the other thing I'd say is get obsessed, stay obsessed. Find the thing that you're interested in and get obsessed with it and stay obsessed and you will get good at it and you will love it and you probably already love it anyway so you might as well just do it (laughs) amen to that um so we appreciate you guys for coming on to the show we hope that all of you wonderful listeners liked this great and awesome discussion that we just concluded (laughs) we had Uh, so much fun there will be a part two of this oh wow there will be there will be dan Dan and helen will work that out we'll get another date there will be a part two because we left a lot untouched mm. in this episode. Uh, Tracy Duran, last note here. There will be three movies at the Royal Regional Fire Museum outside the in the parking lot, and the other three will be at Monday Park on Broadway. Carl Nichols, great guest for today's podcast. Thank you very much for that. And Carl Nicholas is our 
president of the yes. Film Society. Carl, yes. Yes. glad you tuned in, my brother. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Um, ladies and gentlemen, take care of yourself and each other. <laughs>